Well, good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming along and welcome you to the Social Capital Residencies Oration and Q&A organised by the Don Dunstan Foundation. My name's David Penberthy. I'm a journalist with News Corp and 5AA and um, I'm thrilled to have been asked to come along tonight as MC for a number of reasons actually. Um, firstly because a couple of weeks ago on our um, morning show, the breakfast show, um, I had the the pleasure of interviewing Alison Hewitt, who is um, the star of the show here tonight. She's at the end of her, um, her stay, approaching the end of her stay here in Adelaide as the um, primary thinker in residence, um, a program that was obviously kick-started many years ago by Mike Rann and has had new life um, breathed into it, spearheaded by the Don Dunstan Foundation with a lot of university support and also um, welcome private sector support. And I think that as someone who works in the populist press quite happily, um, there's been times where programs such as the Thinkers in Residence have been derided as pie in the sky, ethereal stuff. And um, talking to Alison um, was really struck by just how pragmatic and practical and um, targeted the kind of work that she's done in, in Canada and wants to apply um, here is. Um, I'm also excited about being here because I grew up in a suburb that is almost um, number one with a bullet on the, the list of those places here in South Australia that's trying to work out how to get from what we call the old economy to whatever the new economy is. Um, my um, school and a lot of the people that I went to school with, which was right next to the old Chrysler factory, their Mitsubishi factory, grew up thinking that they had a job for life just down the road and it's now the um, uh, venue for the, the Tonsley precinct, where fingers crossed a whole lot of cool stuff is happening, but whether there's enough cool stuff to sustain the type of jobs that um, were once taken for granted in the, in the 1960s and 70s remains to be seen. So I think it's something that every South Australian should have a passionate interest in. What do these new jobs look like? Where do these new jobs come from? I know that the scope of tonight's discussion isn't that narrow, but um, it's obviously um, the number one challenge that we do face here in SA. Um, before we proceed, I just want to take a moment before we do the welcome to country to run through a bit of housekeep um, housekeeping. Um, there's three exit doors. The toilets are down the stairs. Um, door on the right, just follow the red arrow down the corridor. Um, questions um, are to be asked to our volunteers. Here you'll see dotted around the theatre who are wearing um, purple lanyards. There are recycling bins in the foyer where drinks will be available after the event. And for those of you who've got the social media bug, please refer to the screen for the hashtag social capital and also hashtag thinker. Before we begin proceedings proper, I'd like to um, ask Rodney O'Brien to come up to the stage to perform the Welcome to Country. A bit taller than me, David. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, good evening everyone. Uh, before I give the welcome to country, I'd just like to uh, say a couple of things. Uh, uh, I'm pretty uh, proud to come here tonight to give welcome to country. Uh, Don Dunstan actually was a, a really good friend of my grandmother. Uh, some people might know of her, Aunty Gladie Elphick, but uh, he actually worked uh, with the... Uh, my nana started up the Aboriginal Women's uh, uh, group in, uh, in Adelaide here and uh, Don Dunson actually was a worker with that group. He gave legal advice to the women when he couldn't get a job in Adelaide as a lawyer because he went from uh, from the Liberal Party to the Labor Party and he was sort of blacklisted when he became a lawyer. He actually graduated from Adelaide Uni and uh, I work at Adelaide Uni and I'm very proud because I work at Wilty Yellow and uh, Wilty Yellow is um, in our language, Ghana language, means uh, sea eagle and the reason why uh, I was given that name because it, the sea eagle always tries to fly at the highest peak for excellence. So that's why we give that name to the uh, Aboriginal Enclave at uh, Adelaide Union so that the students strive for the highest point they can achieve. So Ghana people have never been satisfied with uh, just being mediocre, you know, always try to be better and always don't leave uh, for tomorrow what you can do today. So there's a bit of philosophy about our culture, but I'm here to give the welcome and uh, I'll give a little uh, joke afterwards, Tricia, because she says you've got to give a joke like your dad, so I'll, I'll do that. Uh, so um, anyway, I'll give the welcome first. 
Machwanga Ganamena, no Wangni, Mani no Budni, Gani Yatana, a Burka Mankalankla, Tendenian Meninko, Nature Yungandaya, Nature Yakandaya, Padiadu, Wadu. On behalf of Ghana people, I welcome you to Ghana country. I do the same best of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. Now for the Jag. Uh, there's three, three people in, the, in a bar uh, talking about the fastest thing they've ever seen an Englishman, Irishman, and an Australian. Okay, so the Englishman says, the fastest thing I've ever seen is a blink like that because it's instantaneous. That's very fast. And the Aussie goes, yeah, that's not bad, mate, but I reckon electricity is the fastest thing I've ever seen because you go to the light switch, or you finish pulling the lever, the light's on. That's bloody quick. And the Irishman goes, sure to be sure, boys. I reckon diarrhea is the fastest thing I've ever seen. And they said, how do you work that out? He said, well, he says, I was in bed the other night. For I could blink or turn the light on, I shut myself. Thank you. <laughs> that was great, Rodney. Thanks very much. Good to have a welcome to country that comes with a gag at the end. It's terrific. OK, um, I'd like to uh, firstly thank all the VIPs who are present tonight, the Chair of the Don Dunstan Foundation Board of Management, former Premier Lynn Arnold, the Chair of the Social Capital Residencies Program, Rob DeMonte, and the representatives of the many partners of um, the Social Capital Residencies. There's also a number of um, presenting partners who we need to thank tonight. Firstly, Helping Hand, um, which is one of South Australia's most trusted aged care providers, servicing the community since 1963, providing home care, independent living and residential aged care services to more than 7,000 people and employing more than 1,400 across metropolitan Adelaide and regional SA. The RAA, which as you all know is an iconic South Australian business, pleased to be part of the Thinkers program around this important topic. RAA's origins as a mutual began at the beginning of the 20th century and has helped form the culture and success of the organisation. And also Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels SA has contributed to the creation of social capital throughout its 63 year history and they joined the program as a residency partner to contribute their expertise and further develop capabilities and ideas that continue to build social capital in the 21st century. Um, we also need to thank all the social capital residencies partners, specifically Adelaide Uni, Flinders Uni, the Government of SA, Social Capital and the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. And we also thank our sponsors for the night, Parade Cellars for providing the wine and Bickford's for the soft drinks that are available after the event. Tonight, we're gonna to be hearing from the Social Capital, Capital Residency's primary thinker, as I told you before, Alison Hewitt, who leads the social innovation programs at Mars Discovery District in Toronto, Canada. Following her oration, we'll have a Q&A style discussion with Alison and a panel of local speakers comprising Carolyn Curtis, Rob DeMonte and Dr Don Russell. At the end of the evening, the Honourable Reverend Dr Lynn Arnold AO will come on stage to give the vote of thanks. But before all that, I would like to introduce to the stage David Pearson, who is the Executive Director of the Don Dunstan Foundation for the opening speech. Um, well, can I too start by acknowledging tonight that we meet on the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, a people who live in a country whose constitution still affords for discrimination on the basis of race, something that hopefully soon will change. And we leap tonight on land that was never ceded, but it is although shared every day, um, and an agreement has never been struck, something again that we hope may soon change. Um, tonight we do meet on the land of the Ghana people, and we acknowledge that on the eve of Reconciliation Week, and we do so in the spirit of reconciliation. Can I also um, reiterate the uh, acknowledgements of the VIPs and everyone who's in the room tonight, and thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the Thinkers program and how we got here and Alison's visit over the last three weeks. So, just over eight weeks ago, uh, we relaunched the Thinkers in Residence program down at the National Wine Centre. Uh, the Thinkers program was an incredible South Australian social innovation. It started in the South Australian Government in 2003 and is a proven method for addressing urgent challenges and for exploring areas of complex need for our state. Um, it helped build a smarter, a fairer, a more prosperous, outwardly looking and future focused South Australia. Between 2003 and 2013, the program resulted in more than $200 million worth of investment here in South Australia and across the nation. And at the Dun Dunstan Foundation, what we've tried to do is take what was really great about that Thinkers program and to build on that. 
In particular, we've brought the program's strengths of helping to improve and move from inspiration to action. What the Thinkers program did was help to break out of this situation where you had experts come from outside and come to Adelaide and inspire you and then generally you go back to your day job and not a lot changes. And the benefit of the Thinkers program was is that you could benefit from that inspiration but you could also have them come back and keep challenging us and make sure that we actually turn that inspiration into action. Um, so what the Thinkers program did was uh, really help change that. And it is a model that's worked because of that um, constant contact with, the, uh, with these thinkers from around the world. So we've had to build on that strength. We've taken it from being a government-run initiative to a government-supported program. And once we've done that, we've partnered with a range of organisations in the community, private, public, university sectors. And out of necessity and design, uh, we have helped to, we've not just lessened the, um, sorry, out of necessity and design, uh, we have helped to lessen the pervasive South Australian perspective that government can and even could solve all of our problems for us. We've taken the model so that, and the recommendations so that uh, the partners in the residency receive the recommendations, not just government. Um, we've also worked so that the recommendations come out early in the process, not just at the end. Uh, and rather than have a number of thinkers focused on a number of issues over a period of time, we've changed it so that um, we have one issue and a number of thinkers who will support the implementation of that issue. And that issue is how do we grow the social economy? Um, not as an end in itself, but as a way to build a more fairer and prosperous South Australia. The fact that we are a great place to live, the fact that we are a great place to raise a family, to visit, to age well and to test new ideas, this is what we we're seeking to build on. We're seeking to grow the social economy through social innovation. Now there are a few terms, social innovation and social economy, that may not mean a lot to a lot of people. And so hopefully um, Alison during her time here has helped us to learn a little bit more about what they are and over the next um, period we'll learn some more. Um, Alison will speak more eloquently about that. But for me, a major part of how we support um, the growing social economy is by taking the charity sector and helping it to be more entrepreneurial and commercially focused and less dependent on government funding, and at the same time working with the private sector to support them to improve their ability to deliver social impact. Alison will explain this further in her speech, and over the next year she comes back and the other speakers talk about these things as well. But the, after all, the starting point of these residencies was a realisation that the fastest growing section of our economy in South Australia right now is the social economy, the care, the education, the health, the creative sectors. And the proposition that we're trying to test through these residencies is that we're able to break down the barriers between the not-for-profit and the for-profit sector and to build a for-purpose sector, a growing, thriving for-purpose sector, we'll be able to realise the opportunities that we face as a state. And there are significant opportunities through things like impact investing, where people are willing to make an investment, receive slightly less of a return, sometimes, not always, and get a social outcome for that investment. Um, the National Disability Insurance Scheme and individualised funding and aged care provide a significant amount of new money and new resources to deliver and help tackle different challenges. And there are new sources of funding uh, that help to do that in those areas, as I said. And for the foreseeable future, we know that the National Disability Insurance Scheme will be the single largest employer in Northern Adelaide, um, which will be significantly impacted by the closure of Holmes later on this year, as um, David was talking about. And there are other opportunities, the changing pace of technology and the sharing economy, and what do these things look like? What does that mean for the way we deliver services to help people? What does an Uber look like in the disability sector, but in a way that it doesn't take the profits and send them offshore, but reinvest them in local communities? How do we look, take these opportunities? How do we have Adelaide as a test bed where we trace new ideas and support others to come here and challenge um, the way we do things? So there are significant opportunities. And I truly believe that our ability to deliver on these things rests in our ability to bring different ideas, to bring different business models, different industries and different forms of investment together in new ways. Uh, we have an incredibly passionate and innovative community service sector. We have a world leading arts and cultural sector. We have incredible scientific knowledges in our university and elsewhere. And we have a, burgeoning, we have a burning platform in our business community with the significant transformation that our economy is going under at the moment. Um, and the uncertainty that that causes for a large number of people in our community. If we don't realise these opportunities, it, to realise these opportunities, we need to stop thinking of the social economy in one place and the real economy in another, and to focus on what Alison talks about, of bringing these things together in forms of new forms of inclusive growth and progressive trade and inclusive innovation. So these are things that Alison will talk more about tonight and over the course of her residencies. Uh, they're things that our other thinkers will talk about as well. 
Um, since arriving here in, uh, uh, three weeks ago, uh, Alison has had a stellar journey of a, doing a range of things. Um, she has spoken and engaged with over 1,200 people in person and, more than, and many more via media and other forms. Over the past week, three weeks, she's held more than 40 meetings with a range of people with a couple more to go. Um, Alison's also participated in 30 presentations, roundtables and public events. And I'm pleased to say she's still standing. As part of these residencies, we've built a coalition of over 42 organisations and partners who are helping to support this process. Um, Alison will talk shortly about her reflections and the common themes that have emerged over, these, over this period of time. In the coming weeks, she'll release her first report. This will be the first of three reports released after each of her visits. Alison will be back in for open state in September, September, October, and again early next year. And during these past three weeks, we've sought to focus Alison's time on two goals. How do we meet the broader objectives of these residencies? And that work has really been um, supported by the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, about looking at the social innovation ecosystem here in South Australia. And also focusing on how do we support individual organisations to implement this work, to take action on what they've learnt, and to quickly put into practice the insights that Alison has shared. Um, the opportunity will come uh, to build on this work with the expertise of a number of specialist thinkers who we'll also be bringing out over the next 12 months. The first of these thinkers will be Susie Souza. She's the founder, she's the co-founder and chief executive officer of Verb, a global social enterprise producing large scale competitions focused on presenting social, focused on solving pressing social and environmental issues. She's based in Adelaide's sister city of Austin, Texas, and she'll be here in early June. And she'll build on the incredible work that Alison's done over these past three weeks, and build on the insights and to um, take advice, uh, to build on the insights and advice that Alison has given us. And one of the things that I think that um, Alison has said that has struck with me, and I'm paraphrasing here, but um, that if you want to shoot for the stars but keep your feet firmly planted in the reality of what you're working on and work with people where they are. And so that's what we've tried to do. We are being deliberately ambitious, but we're focusing it on what we can do practically here and now. And the ambition um, is reflected in the name of these residencies. We chose not to call this project the social economy residencies or the social enterprise residencies or the impact, res impact innovation residencies or any other number of buzzwords that you could string together in a sentence. Instead, what we chose to call them was the social capital residencies. Now, it is a play on words. Sure, we want to build social capital in the way that you build financial capital and other things. But most importantly, um, the primary aim of these residencies is to build on South, Australian, South Australia's founding purpose to be a better society, while addressing our most contemporary need, job creation. So the goal, and hence the name, is South Australia to be as well known for social innovation as Geneva is for diplomacy, Tamworth is for country music, or Canadians are for being polite. Um, Adelaide, we want truly to be the social capital of Australia. And we chose this name because it gives, it builds on the work done by the social capital residency, the social capital movement founders, David Patterson and Matt Anderson, and because it has historical and intellectual honesty. The colony of South Australia was established by a bunch of dreamers escaping from industrial England, wanting to carve out a place for themselves in the world, free of persecution, and as a place that wasn't just a dumping ground for convicts. It was instead meant to be a place where we could build a better society. That reformist aim of our province and our colony continued throughout our history, and particularly, I might add, through the Dunstan era. So there you have it. We have a deliberately bold ambition. We have the aim being sky high, but our feet firmly planted in what can we do today, now, to make this a reality. And this is a process that's not going to achieve all of this overnight. Um, Alison will share her thoughts with us shortly, and she's not the messiah. She's the thinker in residence. She's going to help share her insights and thoughts. But Alison's, Alison's report won't solve our problems. It will just help guide the way. It will help challenge our thinking and help realise the massive opportunities that we face. And when the Don Dunstan Foundation took over the Thinkers in Residence program, we tied with the idea of calling it the Change Makers in Residence program, because really that's what we're trying to create here, change. But that misunderstands the role of the thinker. The thinker in the process is not the change maker. They're the catalyst. The change makers are all of us. We're the ones who stay here when Alison goes home. We're the ones who will be responsible for taking the insights and the actions that she gives us and using that to take charge of our own destiny. So when you walk out of here tonight, reflect on what Alison has said and think about what you can do in the time between now and where Alison returns to help achieve this goal of Adelaide being the social capital of our region, or as we at the Dunstan Foundation like to say, to inspire action for a fairer world. Thanks very much for that, David. Well, it's now time to welcome Alison Hewitt to the stage. 
Alison has assisted hundreds of social ventures to become economically sustainable and to increase their social impact. She's initiated and implemented public policy to support social enterprise and has developed a range of social innovation programs at Mars in Toronto. Tonight's oration follows three weeks of intense engagement, as you just heard from David, with individuals and organisations across private, public and non-government sectors here in South Australia. Indeed, she's met with many of you who are in the room here tonight, and we are all very excited to hear her comment on what she has called South Australia, positioned for leadership in the social economy. Please welcome Alison Hewitt to the stage. Thank you for, for coming in. Um, and managing the rain, and uh, it's like the first rain I've had since I've been here, so it figures it's, it's, on, it's on tonight. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, everything's good? Okay, thank you so much. Terrific. So David, I, I really want to start by saying um, I deeply appreciate the work uh, of you, your vision and your leadership in this area, and the Herculean efforts of the staff of the Don Dunstan Foundation. It's been pretty wonderful to be here. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a thing in front of me, so I'm going to have to keep flipping back like that. But, so I'm inviting you to join me on this journey from Canada to Australia. Uh, I have found uh, people in Adelaide to be so incredibly kind and generous and welcoming, and it has been a pleasure to hang out with all of you, and I really look forward to continuing this journey. But you know, I've come much further than Toronto. I've come from Mars. <laughs> That's the first joke. Um, and, and so this is uh, uh, me listening to the governor uh, with Evelyn O'Glockland from the Volunteering SA, NNT. And listen, you don't have time. The best thing about the thinker is you don't have time to go to 60 plus meetings. And it's, it's only been two and a half weeks, David. I know it feels like, but it's only been two and a half weeks. So, so I wanted to offer you the chance to hear um, what I heard from you, what you think of the social economy. So let's start with a couple of quotes. No one understands what we're talking about when we say social capital or social innovation. We need to map the social innovation ecosystem. We need a shared narrative and accessible language and the business case for promoting the social economy. So Jeff Mulgan, who was the thinker in residence in 2007, 2008 around social innovation, says that innovation, social innovation is social in its means and its ends. And it's the simplest kind of definition and if we think about how do we do good better, then that works just as well. But with the help of our incredibly good friends at TAXI, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, we've built on the work of SIG, or Social Innovation Generation, I'm probably mucking up all my names here, SIG, TAXI, there are all these little acronyms all over the place. But we've started by creating a glossary of terms. So if someone says, what do you mean by the social economy? We're putting this online, and we're actually encouraging people to contribute and keep it up to date. We also held a historic mapping workshop, again with our friends from Taxi, and the results of that are pending. So we've been very busy. The glossary's going, the, the workshop was amazing. We still need to develop the business case, including the cost of not doing anything or holding on to the status quo, which I would suggest is probably not even an option. And of course, we need to continue to build the social capital community, the work that has been started by our friends at Social Capital. So many of you may know this. It is the Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Map by Paul Daly of the City of Adelaide. And we didn't want to start fresh. We started with his work. And we're going to leverage that to capture what's happening in this social economy and add to it, like a, with particular columns around impact investing or measuring impact or that kind of thing. We talked a lot. <laughs> and here's just a few slides that I think really resonated with groups, just for those of you that haven't had the chance to sit in an audience and hear me ramble on. This is what David talked about, a bit of a spectrum where the world is going from not-for-profits that were 100% grant dependent to for-profits who were 100% about the single bottom line. In fact, pressure is being put on both ends of this spectrum to think about the messy middle. Everybody's encouraged to move along, no matter where you are, move along towards the middle. So if you're social first, you think about how you're generating income or setting up social enterprises. And if you're money first, you need a social license to operate. 
What does your CSR program like? Or creating shared value program? Or in fact, this wonderful new corporate forum like B Corps that are happening in that blended value space. We talked about scaling. When we talked about scaling, we often think about it as growth, scaling out. More, more, franchises do more. But in fact, in the world of social innovation, you can also scale up which is really about looking at policies and laws and what are the levers that we can push within government. And finally, the big goal is how do we scale deep? How do we get to culture change? How do we change people's behaviors and hearts and minds so they do differently? And finally, this is something we lovingly call the periodic table of systems change. Uh, what this means is that change has to happen at all levels. And sometimes in the nonprofit sector, we forget that the market is a huge force for change. When we think about scale, we have to think about opportunities to prototype. So all the time, uh, for those of you that were just at the gallery, we heard about a program that was implemented with the best of intentions. That's not the way to do it. Don't go right to scale. Start small, pivot, learn course correct, and then you'll get to the place where you need to be as long as you're engaging users and eventually get there. But sort of designing programs in an ivory tower or in a policy shop just doesn't cut it anymore. We've got to think differently about how we do this work. The next one is really about the policy lever and how we need to get the evidence, always remembering that evidence is necessary but not sufficient. And finally, where's the receptor capacity? If we have these great innovations, Who's absorbing them? How do we make sure they're actually systems that are ready to take them and run with them? No point just developing very cool stuff if it's not gonna be used. So Adelaide, how do you see yourself? A few more quotes, and David referenced some of them. Adelaide's founding was a social experiment, a planned community different from the other places in Australia. We are not Sydney or Melbourne. We are conservative and afraid of risk. We complain and then we accept the bridge, the oval. Now, the Adelaide Plains were inhabited by the Ghana tribe before the European settlers, and it's on their land we have the chance to build a future that works for all. We need inclusive growth. We need to understand and celebrate what makes Adelaide different and unique, and we will not define ourselves by what we are not. Going back to Jeff's Thinker in Residence program, he noted amazing innovations that came out of Adelaide and came out of South Australia. The problem was they ebb and flow. This is the concept of snapback, which says when you have the dominant system pulling on both ends, no matter what the innovation is in the trough, if you think of that as a marble in the trough, there'll be attractors pulling it back to the status quo. And if we don't get that trough deep enough, those innovations will slide right back out again. And that's what happens time after time after time. We have to get, and I know this sounds like a pipe dream, but we have to get into a space where it's not driven solely by political agendas. We need to deepen the trough. When I was picked up at the airport, which was terrific, by Trish and Carolyn, they came right up to the gate. I said, where's security? How, do you, how would you get up to the gate? And they said, it's Adelaide. Life is easy. Now, it's not easy for everybody, but it's easy for the vast majority of us. And that's pretty incredibly wonderful. And although there were some signs of it, as Davis referenced, there's not enough of a burning platform to drive us to where we need to go. We do have slow job growth and rising social challenges. But in fact, there's another quote. It's not attributed. I'll just say he's in the audience, but I'm not attributing it. In Adelaide, you can get in touch with anyone you want. The pace of change is glacial. So how do we turn that into a strength? It's not six degrees of separation here. It's about 0.5. And not only that, lots of people are married to each other. Family, it's, it's incredible. So that is an incredible strength for us to leverage. And maybe that glacial pace gives us something the rest of the world is missing. Maybe it gives us a chance to think. And there is growth, but it's not in mining and manufacturing, but it's in the area that David talked about. It's the social economy. 
the rationale for this residency. So Adelaide, I just want you to remember that you can do hard things. You always have. Just don't get complacent and don't forget to tell the stories of excellence. Even while the systems are fragmented and sometimes broken, there are pockets that we have to celebrate. Here's just a few. The Indigenous Prosperity Fund, Fluid Solar, which is up near the Stretton Center, a building that is 100% off the grid and now using this technology to build affordable housing. Renew Adelaide, while not perfect, is an amazing innovation. And up in Holden, and we talked about the Mitsubishi plant, David, I would say in Holden, what they've tried to do is look around the world, which is something that Adelaide is spectacular at, for best-in-class transition strategies. 80% of the people who've already been transitioned have, been, have done so appropriately. That's about 200. There's about 900 more to go. But what they have done, what they used to do is give you an envelope, and it's a terrible situation, 900, it's terrible, but you used to get an envelope and say, good luck. Now what they've done is deconstructed the assets of their employees, project management, standardization of systems, all of these kind of things that are actually of value to others in the community. And then they bring employers in and sell Holden employees' skills. It's a really new and unusual way, and I don't know anybody else globally that's doing it this deep. Far from perfect, still a tragic situation, but trying to use innovation to make the best of it. And I would also say the Thinker in Residence program, which is really a very, it's a very interesting program. And I have to say that the stars are not the thinkers. The stars are Adelaide, because Adelaide is willing to listen to others. And believe me, that's rare. Because, this is gonna be shocking, can you read that? It says, Adelaide is a public sector town. I know, right? And so here's what I was absolutely stunned at when I came here, which was the level of dependence on government. Because there are real pros and cons to that. So we need to be more critical of that particular perspective and look to continue to create opportunities in the community as has been done, as David mentioned, by the Dunstan Foundation with cross-sectoral ownership of this initiative. The challenges are we don't have a joined up government. We have the costs borne in one area and saved by another, like health promotion and health. There's no space for disruptive innovation. People are incentivized to say no to minimize risks. And innovation is often not only not rewarded, it can sometimes be punished because Treasury Board will claw back any kinds of efficiency savings. In the political world, those that work for them often tell them what they want to hear. Nonprofits don't want to rock the boat, they want that year-end funding. And everything is tied to election cycles. And speed is such a challenge, they have to do things so quickly, they don't have the time to get out and work with people on the ground. Here's one of my favorite quotes. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. We do the opposite. We rush to solve. Where's the space? Where's the time to think? And I'd also love this quote, which is, no problems can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. If you're not getting out and having discussions with people who see the world differently from you, who disagree with you, then we're stuck in this kind of paradigm. But the opportunity, the opportunity is the history of innovation that comes from government is incredible, especially in this state. We have leveraged, we have opportunities to leverage incredible initiatives like Smart Cities Agenda, and there's a huge opportunity around social value procurement. How does government buy not only local, but buy from social enterprises? But what we need is to make that easy for them to do the right thing. So we need lists of social services who are capable of providing those services. And there's great models already in place and we can learn from them. We need to ensure we have an appropriate and enabling regulatory environment for charities to generate revenue and secure impact investing. I come from a country with an Elizabethan charity law. It's crazy and we're continually working on that and I think there's lots of opportunities here to make sure that environment is enabling. And despite all of that, I would say everybody that I've met in government is absolutely doing their best 
and we need to advocate with empathy. We don't go at them with placards and hit them over the head for what they can't do. We go at them with empathy and understand what we can do together. That's the huge opportunity. And I also want to point out there's a massive movement to public sector innovation labs. And taxis in early discussions with people in government here. And I think there's lots to learn from what's happening around the world, particularly this group, Mind Lab in Denmark, which has really set the standard. You think it can't be done? This is the Canadian cabinet, where Trudeau announced that he's got a cabinet that looks like Canada. Apparently, there's been a new law passed since I left that says we can't um, get back into Canada unless we show at least one Trudeau slide. So uh, this is my requisite, uh, requisite thing done there. Um, so let's talk about corporates. So corporates, I believe, have an economic imperative. There are organizations like JP Morgan who have a huge impact in Detroit where they're helping to grow the local economy, not only through donations, but through pro bono support. Think about the expertise that's based in these corporations that we can unlock to do good better. Organizations like Unilever, where the CEO is rejecting the live and die by the quarterly statements and seeking to take a longer term view for sustainability. It's actually good for business and it's good for society. B Corps, which I mentioned. We had a great session with the B Corps community. Businesses that see business as a force for good, nonprofits. We got to think differently about how we work with groups like this. And we'd be well advised to spend some time understanding what drives them and how we can work together. Because we have incredible power as consumers. I want to acknowledge uh, both Lee May and Nick Crowther um, from Dirt Build and Free Range Futures. They've really taken it on the chops. And one of the quotes up there is, I'm so glad all of this is happening. I felt crazy on my own in this space. Not-for-profits are sometimes seen as cheap service providers for government. But governments and nonprofits need a new relationship that talks about co creating solutions. We need an asset map of what can be given to nonprofits to run. So, in the world of social housing, a lot is being downloaded onto the nonprofit sector. What things are being done by government that could be better done by nonprofits? Do we have an asset map of that? Is that what we want? Those are the questions we should be thinking about. We need to focus on knowledge translation. We have an aging uh, group of folks who are running our nonprofits as we do all around the world. What does knowledge translation look like? What are their opportunities for the intergenerational transfer of knowledge? How do we get on top of that before it's too late? And some people say, well, you know, uh, nonprofits are really competitive with each other. That's because we have a deficit mindset. We're told to fight over crumbs instead of baking new pies. Again, an asset-based approach. There's huge opportunities for shared services, shared staffing models, and focusing on our particular areas of expertise if we think like a system with the user at the center. And if I've heard four letters over the past few weeks, it's been NDIS. This has been a massive disruption to the sector and a focus on consumer-directed care, which means a change from our clients to customers. Some are ready. Innovation teams are in place. And there's a few in this audience tonight. And if you want to talk about this more, chat with Meals on Wheels, Helping Hands, Community Living in Australia, and the Can Do organizations. We need to flip the old paradigm. What about a conference on the business of aging? And what about the creation of feedback loops, other than elections, to get information back to governments on what we're learning on the ground? And what are the challenges? Instead of us talking to each other and complaining, what are the feedback loops that we need to put in to make these systems better? And then there's the academy. Wow, you guys have amazing post-secondary institutions. What an impressive array of programs and services. And a real strength is the ability to attract international students. But look at these, Tonsley and Stretton. And here's what I was told. Make them work better together. It's really hard to navigate the range of innovation hubs out there. So I did. I talked to them, and they said, we work together. We work together all the time. We share equipment. We navigate. 
but that's not known outside the system. So in the innovation and entrepreneurship space, let's help people figure out how they're going to navigate the right programs. Is there a graduation system? Is there an opportunity for you to think like a system where you can share things like market intelligence so you all don't have to have contracts around that, where you have a joint fund, where you have particular expertise, where it's really clear how to navigate from one to the other. This is Scope Global. 6,000 alumni from this program that goes overseas to learn and work with social entrepreneurs comes back to Australia and there's no receptor capacity, there's no place for them to use that kind of talent. 6,000, it's about 500 in South Australia. Aboriginal youth are the fastest growing population. How are we planning to use that expertise? And volunteerism, apparently 86% of not-for-profits say they need more volunteers. When I met with the governor, he said, volunteering is the link to meaningful happiness. Doesn't that sound like him? I love that. But I would add, it's also about enlightened self-interest. It, it's about working with others so you can increase your innovation capacity. And it's about increased social cohesion and belonging. So here's a wonderful program called Studio Y. That's a youth leadership academy focused on creating the skills that we need for the 21st century. And I'm not talking artificial intelligence. I'm talking soft skills like influencing, design thinking, systems thinking, and cross-sectoral collaboration. Who's going to take up the challenge to set up this academy? There's a huge issue around financing and metrics. We need to think of new ways to finance the social economy. South Australia has no culture of philanthropy, I'm told. How do we really know if someone's making a difference? These are the challenges that are out there. But I'm going to suggest to you that there are untold private sector assets that need to be and could be unlocked for public good. One of my colleagues, Stephen Hutter, the CEO of the McConnell Foundation, will be in Adelaide in November and December. I'm going to ask him to really spend some time with you to talk about what it means to unlock public and private assets for public good and how we've been able to succeed in that. Carolyn from Taxi is helping lead that work. Next, as you all know, there's a trend to outcomes-based financing, SIBs, and it will be demanded, demanded, particularly as we experience the intergenerational transfer of wealth that we demonstrate the impact we were able to make. Social enterprises offer real opportunities in this space, but if you're a nonprofit and you're gonna take on a social enterprise, I hope you have the culture and I hope you have the discipline and the mindset to make it a success. There's lots of stuff already happening here. About 50% nationally, I don't have South Australian data, but about 50% of not-for-profits and charities make income other than through grants. Now that could be interest or other things, but it's showing that we're going in the right direction. And we have a real opportunity to benchmark how we want to see that proceed. And there's global standards. We should be talking about the sustainable development goals. I don't hear a lot of talk about that, but it's globally and Australia can see how it's doing with others. Vital signs is how to make this available at the local level. So you know there are 10 plus one economic priorities, seven strategic priorities from the government. I don't know what our local community, what are our vital signs? So this is an example of a report where um, what they indicate is that for 30 years, Communities have been responding to hunger with food banks and other strategies, but food bank usage shows no sign of slowing down. In fact, it's 31% higher than it was before the downturn. We need to feed the hungry people in front of us. We need to alleviate suffering. And as David said, we need to keep our feet in the soil. But where's our reaching for the stars? And how do we know what we're doing good better? We have to show that we're able to be critical on our own terms and from the community up as well as from the government and international agencies down. You know what we need? We need a sense of the possible. If I were to wish for anything, I would not wish for wealth and power, but for the passionate sense of the potential 
For the eye which every young and ardent sees the possible, pleasure disappoints, possibility never. Few more quotes for you. We need to see social and economic as two sides of the same coin. We need to find ways to link programs like the EDB and social inclusion. People keep knowledge to themselves, toxic for innovation. We need to celebrate open. And look what we're doing with Brand SA. There's a million opportunities to celebrate and reward open. And how do we engage South Australians who live in rural communities? One of the greatest innovations from Canada is the Women's Institute. It's a rural social innovation. What about the stump jump plow? I just wanted to say that because it's such a cool term. But let's ensure that we are uncovering everything that we've got from those outside the urban areas. And look at this, the Royal Adelaide Hospital site, or the RAW. There are many, many great minds working on this site and what it could be for Adelaide. Maybe this could be our site for inclusive innovation Adelaide style. And by that, I mean solid economic plan, social innovation, and cultural. The creative industries in this city are so strong, you could bring them together for profit, for purpose, and for participation. A place that's not focused just on ideas or even research, but going to the next step to focus on implementation and knowledge translation. Where are the global leaders in that space? We are a test city. What is that if not a place to experiment, a place of innovation? But this work needs to be curated. It's not just a case of build it and they will come. We need real and serious curation. Intermediaries and network weavers to knit together the parts that don't connect, that don't in fact even talk to each other. Innovation happens everywhere. It accelerates on the margins. But how do you see the site? Do you touch one part of it and it's a rope? Do you touch another part of it and it's a fan? We need voices at the table your voice, maybe not the table, maybe around the elephant, but whatever it is, you need something on what this site can be. So what I've heard is that Adelaide can explore becoming the place to think, the place to solve complex global challenges across sectors with innovation and creativity, a safe place to experiment and take risks, to practice social R&D in all its forms. I would suggest to you it should be adjacent to government where we share the risks and celebrate the rewards. And Jill Hicks, which many of you may know, a proud Adelaidean, feels we should call South Australia the state of mind. I love this, and this is really cheesy. I literally went outside, took a picture of someone's license plate, then I thought I better cover it up with some stuff in case they're in the audience. But, but the concept of a state of mind, just like I have had the privilege of doing, coming to Adelaide to think. And the raw site may be the location for such an aspiration and such an inspiration. Combine it with another great skill that we have here of tourism, and you can create an innovation vacation opportunity. <laughs> and if that sounds a bit out there, may I remind you of Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer's assertion that first, the truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Thirdly, it is accepted as self-evident. I look forward to traveling this journey with you. Here we go, my friends. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We're getting you the mic. Thank you so much for Alison. That was a terrific speech. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, you can't get too comfortable there, I'm afraid, because you're going to be um, the first addition to our, uh, our panel. 
Alison. It's going to be a great um, opportunity for us to tease out some of the, the themes that you've, uh, you've raised and some of the very thought-provoking uh, observations you had about our, our fair city. Um, now, the second part of, of tonight's get-together is a Q&A, &Q <laughs> you can tell I don't watch the ABC that often, a Q&A style discussion, hopefully without the violence, featuring a panel of leading South Australian speakers. Firstly, Carolyn Curtis. Carolyn is the CEO of the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, which is one of Australia's most respected social enterprises focused on addressing, addressing challenging social issues. Carolyn started her career as a social worker and joined Taxi in 2010 as a secondee from State Child Protection Services. As CEO, Carolyn has grown Taxi from an, an initiative funded by government to a sustainable social enterprise operating in most major cities across Australia. And she's deepened Taxi's expertise in child protection and broadened its influence into other areas including ageing and disability. She is a director with the Social Innovation Exchange. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, next up, Don Russell. Dr. Don Russell was appointed as Chief Executive of the Department of Premier and Cabinet here in SA on February 6, 2017. He was previously the Chief Executive of the Department of State Development from 2014 to 2017 and Secretary of the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Innovation, Climate Change, Science, Research and Tertiary Education from 2011 to 13. He was also previously Independent Chairperson of State Super, a role that he held from January 2008, and he was the Global Investment Strategist at BNY Mellon Asset Management Australia, with BNY Mellon being a global investment company. The fourth and final member of the panel is Rob DeMonte. Rob is the Chair of the 2017-18 South Australian Social Capital Residencies. He's a Fellow of Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, also a past National President and a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. He's a professional company director appointed to a number of for-purpose and for-profit boards, including the Australian Advisory Board for Impact Investing, the Social Capital Advisory Board, the Chartered Accountants Benevolent Foundation Limited, and the President of the RSPCA Australia. He's been a management consultant and a design thinker for over 35 years for clients in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors in Australia and overseas. I'd like to invite the panel up onto the stage. Okay, well, thanks for um, your time tonight, guys. And um, we're, uh, what we're going to do is um, we've actually asked a few partners if um, they would like to ask a question. So please raise your hands if you do. After that, we'll get um, a few questions from the rest of the audience, but we're going to tempt fate here and see if we can beam him in by the uh, miracle of video. Our first question comes from Adelaide's Lord Hello Mayor. Hello everybody, Martin, Martin Hazy, Hazy, Lord Mayor, City of Adelaide. Great to see you. Sorry that I can't be with you tonight. Congratulations to Alison. It's wonderful to have Alison, someone so skilled as our thinker in residence for Adelaide and South Australia. I recently met with Alison in my office and we had a terrific chat about all things entrepreneurship. I've got a question for you. What does the social economy, what does social entrepreneurship mean to the city of Adelaide at a city-wide scale? What are the benefits? I encourage you to have a good think about that and I look forward to hearing your answers. Thank you, good luck, bye for now. Who wants to kick things off? I just talked a lot. So I think <laughs> that one of the other people should... Well, how about you, Don? You're you're the, yeah, it's moderated. You're the head honcho at government. Let's see what, uh, see what you've got for Martin Hazy. Sounds like he's trying to outsource his own job a bit there. Yeah, well, Asking for free ideas. Well, no, that's good. That's good. I mean, uh, you know, one of the, the strengths of, um, of South Australia is that uh, uh, it is a large state, but the preponderance of the, the population is in the, in the city itself. And one of the, um, I don't think it's just the current strength, I think it is something structurally uh, a strength of this city is that there is, because the city and the state are, I mean, in many ways, South Australia is a city state. Uh, and so there is an unusual degree of uh, cooperation between uh, the city and the, uh, 
the state itself. I mean, this doesn't exist in, in other jurisdictions around the world where there's often a competitive relationship between um, the state and, you know, the principal city in, um, in the state itself. So we do have, I think, a remarkable opportunity to use the city as, a, uh, as an active part of the state government's uh, strategy for the state. And, um, and certainly in my time here, um, that has been really very much to the fore. So the fact that Adelaide is a, a lighthouse city within the Cisco program is good news for um, the city, but it's also good news for the state because it showcasing Adelaide is really sh showcasing um, the state itself. So uh, I think that provides the mayor and, and the city here with an extra degree of freedom that Melbourne doesn't have, for example. I mean, we're, we've signed on uh, to make Adelaide the, uh, the first carbon neutral city yeah, in the world. Melbourne has done the, the same, but Melbourne does not have the backing of the state government. Um, Adelaide does. It's actually a key part of the, of the Premier's uh, policy in this area, which means that uh, the, the capacity to use the, the power of the state and the commitment of the of the of the mayor and the city uh, is is really a very powerful thing. So, um, if I was just going to make an observation for the mayor, I would say that uh, we he is in a position to um, utilise you know the power of the state and the commitments of the state in in, in the area of innovation in a way that his uh, counterparts don't have around the world. And I th and I think. Um, uh, if I was going to point him in, in any direction, it would be just to make the best use of, uh, of that arrangement. Can I... I'll just add a, an additional comment, if I can. Um, and I guess working, uh, sort of extending one of your slides, uh, which was the graph, love graphs, um, where we look at where the growth is happening in this state, and it's in the, in the social sector. Um, and the stats will tell you that it is the fastest growing part of, of South Australia and Adelaide. And so I look at it from a perspective of what's the opportunity. And I think it's growing by about 12%, 12 or 12 13% at the moment. Uh, but you look at other parts of the world, and there was, in the UK, for example, it's growing at 35%. And you look at um, new businesses, new social enterprises uh, are being created at a much faster rate than your traditional for-profit SMEs. And we know that we're an SME state. We know that we need to find new businesses, new opportunities, um, rather than relying on, on the history of uh, what we have today. And so our opportunity, I think, is to, to learn how others uh, have achieved that, to understand that with, with the connectedness that we have, um, that we can outstrip 35%. Uh, the New Ventures Institute here uh, indicated that, uh, you know, it seems that those new ventures that start that have a social purpose are much more sustainable than those that don't. And so I think there's an opportunity. There's a great opportunity for us to say, well, here's a, here's a sector that is growing. Uh, we can capitalise on that uh, through the benefits that, that you've articulated about the closeness of the city. You got anything you'd like to add to that, Carolyn? Or? No, I guess I was just sitting here thinking about the um, the 100 Resilient Cities initiative in terms of also thinking about the power of a city to think about how it harnesses resilience to take us into the future. Um, and so whether we think about our economy, whether we think about our migrant communities, whether we think about food security, a whole range of things that are changing and evolving for us, um, the city can harness huge power and resilience in terms of really um, tackling uh, some of those new challenges that we have ahead of us now. And I think some of the entrepreneurship culture that we see in Adelaide and through um, some of the accelerators that, uh, that Sue Hits run and the Adelaide City Councils run, that we can already see that that's starting to emerge. Could I just add one little little uh, extra bit to Martin Hazy's question, and I know you're probably still recovering from your, your half hour address, Alison, but a lot of the things that he talked about and some of the things in your presentation are probably the type of things that if you're in Peel Street might sound like they're all the go, but how do we get them to the 
desk of the Mayor of Port Augusta or the Mayor of um, Elizabeth? How do we make sure that this isn't like a, a massive inner city exercise and that it really breaks out into suburbia and the regions, particularly those areas where um, you know, you've got 30%, 40% unemployment and massive social disengagement? Uh, thank you very much. So I did have some time uh, up in Elizabeth. Uh, it was one of the most encouraging places I've been. I was a little um, reluctant. I'd been hanging around uh, people at universities and uh, you know, really wonderfully um, well-educated and you know, really driven to do this kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, these people completely get it. This is the easiest gig ever. And I was nervous about going up to Elizabeth because I thought, you know, it, it's, um, it's going to be really challenging. Now I have to put my money where my mouth is. And uh, place after place after place that we went to, we went to a food co-op where they're doing incredibly innovative things and engaging community in that. They have more volunteers than they can handle up there. People want to be engaged and make a difference. I talked about the, what was happening um, with the Holden site and how they'd really tried to be innovative and bring the community in. And it was that uh, we went to Northern Sound system, um, you know, and this guy, this guy works for the council. I go, how do you work for council? You're like completely under the radar. He goes, yeah. And then we get a royal visit and we pop up and go, look how good we are. And then we go back <laughs> under the radar. And, you know, they figured it out. And, you know, I just, I, I loved what you said about, you know, leveraging each level of government. One of my social innovations is 2 one one People don't care about the level of government. They're the one taxpayer. They're the one citizen. You know, you figure it out. And you figure out how to work to make our lives better. And we will work with you to make our lives better, but we sometimes get really caught up in the levels of government and we lose ourselves. And so that's a little bit of about, you know, taking back our power and um, as citizens. I know I'm so radical. <laughs> <laughs> I think the next question is from Penny Gale from the RAA. If she's in the audience and wants to ask it herself, she can. If not, I'm happy to put it on her behalf. I know. There's Penny. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'd first just like to add something to the end of Martin's question. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has listened to the TED uh, Radio Hour talk on building better cities, um, but there's a great little piece in there about somebody who wanted to be the mayor and he went door knocking uh, and met this woman who he said, and he said, look, this is a great city, but it could be better. We could have better restaurants and a new airport and this and that. And the, this uh, woman said, uh, sh let me show you something and took to the back of her house outside and pointed to a swimming pool that was empty and it had kids playing dice in it and uh, um, a gazebo that had graffiti all over it and people playing really new uh, loud music and said I don't I don't actually need to go out to restaurants I'm a pretty good cook I don't go anywhere these are the problems that I need solved to make this place a better place for me to live. So I would say to Martin, go out and talk to the people who live, work or use the city, work out what their pain points are and work from there rather than trying to do that from within the council itself. I think it's about engagement. But uh, my question's to Caroline. Uh, we've heard um, Alison talk a bit about what some of the other kind of big businesses and corporations are doing. I'm just wondering if you've got some ideas for the RAA. You know, we've been around for quite a long time. We represent almost 700,000 people in the state. How do you think we could become more involved in the whole world of social capital? So if I think about our, uh, our workforce at the moment at, at, um, at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, uh, we employ people from all across the world. Um, we have people from, uh, from India, from, uh, from Texas, from the UK, everywhere, and over a third of our staff would come from there. Yet we have the most phenomenal group of volunteers um, at Taxi. We have two of those volunteers now who are actually doing the, the main work, the main everyday work um, in, in our social innovation teams. And then we also have a whole cohort of uh, carers at the moment who have or are caring for a loved one um, who are helping us to create a new way to improve outcomes for carers. Um, these are your members. Um, and these are your members that are providing just spectacular value to my business. And um, 
And I think something that Alison talked about was this, this uh, concept of uh, intergenerational sort of transmission. Um, in terms of thinking about the future of RAA, I think you've got some of the answers at, at your fingertips in terms of your member base actually could provide phenomenal, uh, a huge contribution to you if you actually engaged them in the future design and the, the future generation of your business, because I know that they're creating huge value for my business currently. Nice stuff. Okay, um, the next question is from Simon Schmidt from Vinovate. Simon, in the crowd? Down there. Can I just say, well, while Simon is, is, is getting the microphone, that the other thing, Penny, is you have uh, so many incredible resources and access to, what did you say, almost everybody over the age of 70 is a member of RAA. Like the, the, the data that you have that could be made available to help people do good better. Like there's, it's, I know you're bugged all the time for resources, but if you could be you know, really strategic about where you want to focus and help the community, there's massive opportunities uh, for you to do that. And I really look forward to seeing how your innovation hub plays out and what actually goes on there. That can be a win-win for you because uh, there is lots of things that, uh, that you, I know that you really want to do and you really have these great aspirations for the RAA but also for the community in which you live. So I'm really looking forward to see what's happening there. So thanks for your playing along with us in this game. Yeah, thanks, Alison. Uh, that was really interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I'm Simon Schmidt, the Managing Director of Vinovate. Uh, we are into a couple of different areas in, this, uh, in our business, uh, but particularly of relevance, one of them is a, a uh, <coughs> water purification project. So the work uh, that you guys are doing and the, and the, um, the talk about in, uh, impact investing, those things are really relevant to you know, where our business is going to be going. So you know, we appreciate the work you're doing there. Uh, my question is, you know, with any successful enterprise, you know, they require a certain degree of confidence and grit. Uh, you know, how are these? How might we build these qualities uh, overall as with with South Australians? You know, how can we really promote that uh, to to achieve our goals? Okay. Now you guys go. Sorry, I have my mic on. I said you guys go. Um, I, I think that we have. Um, uh, as you mentioned, some great institutions here uh, with the universities, um, uh, the, the three local universities and international uh, universities as well. Um, so I think that whole question of grit or resilience, um, the development of people, uh, we need to leverage uh, and have the opportunity for, for to leverage the expertise that comes out of the universities. Uh, some of the university programs are, are not just educational in the sense of a typical curriculum, but they, they are striving to be much more engaged with industry. And so there are a lot of mentor type programs uh, where they're engaging with industry leaders and others that have been through the wars. Um, so I think that uh, programs that uh, can be led out of the universities that support um, social enterprises and others that need to, to build resilience and need to build capability would be really important. Can I just say as well, someone that I feel is living this every day at the moment um, for seven years, um, it's, uh, it's fascinating because sometimes all you want is someone you can sit down and talk about your cash flow issues with. <laughs> someone you can say, um, uh, you know, you can talk about how you're going to scrape together enough money to pay everyone the next week. And no one likes to talk about these things, but this is the reality of, of running a social enterprise in the early years. And I can't stress enough what it means to find people that have your back and that you can have those conversations with and they're not going to go to the next person and go, oh my God, Carolyn's got cash flow issues. Um, but, you know, I, I think we need to think about how we build this, this network in South Australia and a really genuine network. And, um, you know, the, the eastern states are, are asking the same issues, but we have such an opportunity here. Um, we have the beginnings of it, but the key is how all the activities hang together, how we as people hang together, how we each other have each other's backs in all of this because anyone that tells you they don't have those times running a social enterprise where they go, um, I'm having cash flow issues this week is lying. Well, either that or they've got some kind of magic going on that I don't, I don't know about. But um, 
yeah, I just, I can't stress that enough and finding ways that we can help create um, that for people and wrap that around people. And Carolyn and I have lots of conversations. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. I, I'm, I'm interested in sort of how that plays out in the public sector, but I would also say in the, in the world of startups, and that's the world that I spend most of my time in, uh, we celebrate failure. We actually issue failure reports. And, and, and uh, you know, we went through school and we were told that failure was a bad thing. And in fact, it's not about the failure, it's about what you learn and what you do differently. And we need to create a culture of that. And I think that builds that grit and resilience with mentors, with lived experience. I mean, the, the work that Carolyn has done for this state and the um, uh, amount of value that she's still able to provide, people should be lined up to be her mentor. And we just have to create those opportunities. Can I add something to that, Carolyn? Um, in a, or ask, uh, add a question to that. In a state such as South Australia, which has got a much, much lower number of really big companies, I mean, if you take Santos and Cooper's and a couple of others out of the equation, the pack thins out pretty quickly. Given the preponderance of really small businesses here that underpin our economy, how do you convince really tiny businesses that aren't like you, motivated by a commitment to social capital, how do you convince someone with four people on their payroll that they should even think about this sort of stuff? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, because I think part of what you're asking there is how do you how do you build that empathy in business and how do you help connect the dots for them so um, so they see opportunity. But I think um, some of the work that Mars have done in particular, you see that the, the social lens actually opens up huge market opportunities. So I think for me, um, what, what people don't often realise is two things. The market opportunities that come along with social impact and also the fact that disadvantage in a declining economy is bad for business. And um, we're doing a piece of work in Dandenong in, um, in Victoria at the moment. And businesses don't realise it until it's on top of them, until they've got 90 positions or 90 vacancies that they can't fill, regardless of the fact that they've got a huge population surrounding them that are unemployed. And, and I think this notion that disadvantage is bad for business is one that we need to be thinking about now. Um, and a declining economy is bad for business. And I think if we can help connect those dots for some of those smaller businesses, then maybe we could get a bit of a shift. Mm. Like Alison's term, um, enlightened self-interest. Yeah. Where it's like altruism can actually help your bottom line. Yeah. yeah the other thing I would just add is that South Australia SME um, economy, but what you'd find is that the majority or a large percentage of them are family businesses. Mm. Um, and if you're talking about empathy and family values and all of those things, um, you can't assume that they don't get it. Right? They mm. don't actually understand there's a bigger purpose. Yes, they need to make money to, to survive, uh, pay the bills, etc. But but they actually appreciate something that's a little bit bigger than that too. Mm. Mm. Can, I, can I just go back to... Yeah, yeah. Can I just go back to the issue sort of grit and resilience and sort of the um, t talent issues that you may be facing in the public sector? Does that kind of thing come up? I, I was going to pick up a couple of the points you made, which uh, did, did strike me as quite um, pertinent in that your notion that uh, South Australia is very much a, a public sector town and that um, the other observation that uh, it's a fairly conservative um, place and uh, there is a well entrenched view uh, that nothing happens in South Australia unless it's touched by the government in some form or other, and and that does have a you know a deadening uh, effect in terms of grit and, and resilience. But I would make the observation that um, one of the consequences of I mean there are a hundred thousand odd um, public servants employed in South Australia, the total workforce is about 800,000, but 100,000 are on the state government payroll. Um, and they're providing services across a, a wide range of very important areas, health being one of them. Um, but there is a tendency, and it's, uh, it's a tendency in all big public enterprises where uh, often there's a blurring in the, uh, the objectives of the organisation. Uh, the people they're actually trying to help, and the well-being of the um, employees themselves. So a, a lot of these um, uh, enterprises, I mean government, um, 
departments uh, are run, you know, very much for the, you know, for their benefit of um, who they're they're dealing with, but the um, the needs of the employees, and you know, this is a wide range of employees, is, is often a very important consideration, particularly in a conservative state, as you've observed, where, you know, in many cases people are very concerned about their working conditions, the way the business is actually run from the perspective of the employees, not necessarily from the perspective of the people they're trying to benefit. Um, but that does provide, at the edges, enormous opportunities for innovation because in that sort of structure, you're more likely to get innovation outside the mainstream public sector. And the other observation that um, I would make, and it's, it, was, it has been made to me many, many times just by self-observation, is that uh, South Australia operates on the smell of an oily rag. There are, there are a lot of people here doing extraordinary things on very little. Um, they're scraping together a little bit from this. They're getting volunteers for this and that. Um, they have a very clear idea of what they're trying to do and they borrow and, <laughs> and they achieve extraordinary things. And I think the fact that we do have a, you know, a conservative state with a, a fairly entrenched public sector does provide, at the edges, extraordinary opportunities for people who want to do good things, um, who have a little bit of wherewithal, uh, who can scrape a bit from here. And because they're at the edges, they can do innovative things. They can do things which would be very challenging if you tried to introduce them into a mainstream government department. That doesn't mean the mainstream government department shouldn't be doing this, but it's actually ready-made, particularly if the mainstream government department has been a bit slow in changing the way it operates. It's actually opening up a big gap. And it's that space where, you know, what we're all talking about. So South Australia is really, and because people have got into the habit if, of, um, of making do on very little, you can create wonderful things. Um, I've noticed uh, that a lot of South Australians um, do extraordinarily well when, they're, um, when they, they move to Sydney or Melbourne or whatever, particularly uh, in areas which are largely supported by government because they're just struck by how much money is available to get things done. <laughs> All the people they're working with are moaning and complaining about how their funding's been cut and whatever. But the South Australians have, have never seen it. <laughs> you know, regular payments, <laughs> capacity to plan ahead. Uh, so I think that's, that is one of the, the strengths that you may have overlooked in, in your summation about the conservative nature of South Australians and the importance of the public sector is that there are a lot of people doing extraordinary things on very little and, and there is a great opportunity for it. Thank you, Don. Um, the next question is from Kirk Dra Drage. I'm apo apologies, uh, Kirk, if I've uh, completely made a hash of your surname there. Kirk is a um, smart city entrepreneur in residence. Thanks, Kirk. <laughs> Hi, th this question is to Carolyn and to, to Alison. Um, given that innovation happens at the collision of ideas, I wonder if you could share your insights and thoughts and experience in how we can take the best and brightest entrepreneurs in this city and help them get connected to the front end of social services so that we're really working with the people that have the real problems and I think, as you said, Alison, become a lot more customer-centric so we're solving real market, real market need. Yeah, that's a great question and that, that's something we think about a lot, like, um, I mean, how many people end up thinking about entrepreneurship and child protection or um, entrepreneurship and um, uh, a range of our other most pressing, you know, social issues that are so often seen as purely government's problem that they that they have to deal with. Um, but we do have to challenge ourselves on the business models that underpin um, all of those challenges we deal with. Um, it's it's been really interesting for me. Um, I'm at the this is a, a little random, but I'm the chairperson of the Adelaide International Bird Sanctuary. And um, a, 
the coast through the north, there's the phenomenal land and the, it's where our migratory birds fly into. Um, the relationship that our Ghana people have with that land and the Vietnamese community have with that land um, is quite profound. And one of the most special things about this work um, is, the, is the cultural engagement and the journey that's taken us all on. Um, but the, the Aboriginal um, kids and young people have um, and are continuing to play a, a huge role. And people that have come from generations of, of unemployment um, and are encountering some of those most pressing issues. Um, and what the team um, from Juna have done is um, they've, they've taken an opportunity out there and they've said, OK, we're going to run a challenge, we're going to run a competition and we want your best and your brightest ideas um, because we think that you as kind of cultural um, champions along with this amazing land that we have presents a remarkable opportunity. So we're looking through that cultural and ecotourism lens um, to take people that have been traditionally some of the most vulnerable in the northern suburbs and said, well, come on, let's, let's think of how we generate new business here because you hold that intellect. Um, and I think, I think that's the challenge and I think that's the challenge that I, I put out there is how do we get into the corners? How do we get beyond Peel Street? <laughs> Um, how do we get into the pockets? Um, how do we think about inclusive growth? Um, because unless we're pushing ourselves into those corners, we're absolutely failing. Thanks, Caroline. And I would just say that um, going back to the elephant, uh, uh, the startups and entrepreneurs and scrappy uh, civil servants, which have not come into my world yet, which is why their quote was not up there. Um, but I want them desperately in my world. Uh, that what we, what we really need to do is think about, you know, if the elephant is a problem, then where are the places where we all get to touch it? Where, where are the places where we all get to define what it is and how we see it? And we're gonna create something pretty awesome if we do that. And so whoever wants to take the lead on creating this space, and with the deepest of respect, it's not government. Please don't let it all be led by them because it's not the only answer. They have a critical part and a critical point at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end. But it's not about them setting the table. I, I tell the story of the um, Canadian Task Force on Social Finance. We, we went to government and said, this is happening in governments around the world. Will you support it? They said, no, but we'll read your report. OK. And then we had to be scrappy. And we had to figure it out. And we did find a former prime minister to at least sit on it. You know, uh, our board, uh, sorry, our CEO chaired it. I mean, there was lots of uh, pretty wonderful opportunities, and we defined that thing really differently. And there was six or seven recommendations, not 87 recommendations, right? So, and you wouldn't let me have 87. You'd say you need five at the most. You know, so really trying to think about how we can bring the skills and expertise of everyone. There's massive opportunities, and the thing is, you just got to call it. Okay. Do we have any questions from the floor? One just here. Uh, yeah, so Matt Salia from Flinders University, and I'm going to pick on you again a bit, Don, because I like the scrappy public servant piece. But um, we've heard from Alison tonight and in a couple of the sessions about um, social procurement and how we can better leverage that for some of the outcomes we've just talked about. And I just wondered, we're seeing evidence of that, Open State and GoGo -Go events and others that are taking an active role. How could we do better at that? How, do, how do, can we set the levers to allow those scrappy public servants to do more? Well, it, it's in the culture, I think, um, pressure. I think scrappy people nibbling at the edges of, of government uh, and bureaucracies is healthy and good. Uh, I think, uh, you know, chief executives can rise um, to the occasion. It, it is helpful if they're operating in an environment where people do expect more. Uh, it, it is easier for an innovative entrepreneurial bureaucrat and you know, they do exist. Um, it is possible to make almost any system work. <laughs> it just takes a lot of skill and uh, patience and, and willingness to push things along. But it certainly makes it easier for entrepreneurial types within the bureaucracy if they're operating in a, an environment where people are not just looking to government for the answers, but they're being prodded um, all the time uh, not only you know here in 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 Adelaide, but you know people are using uh, examples from around the world. It makes it a lot easier for you know 
bureaucrats and chief executives who want to do things, if they can then um, harness uh, the interest. But if they have, if everyone is passive, it becomes increasingly difficult for for anyone to make any you know large government bureaucracy to work. So ideas. I mean, I've, I've, my whole career is based on the notion that um, you know good ideas drive out bad ideas. But you do need people to 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 generate the good ideas so that people can work with them, harness them, and uh, go about the business of slaying the bad ideas. So, um, uh, can but you it, speak uh, in in terms of um, <coughs> well, um, it, it is one of the areas where there has been uh, quite a deal of innovation uh, in in Adelaide, in South Australia, in in recent years, in, is using the government's um, procurement budget to achieve, you know, not only um, sensible commercial outcomes for the government in terms of procuring uh, services and goods at competitive rates, but also to be conscious of uh, the other benefits that can flow to South Australia if you if you turn your mind to, um, you know, not only um, you know giving preference to um, you know objectives here in South Australia that people want. Um, so that is well and truly in hand. I think we've actually used uh, procurement quite effectively in terms of uh, Aboriginal procurement. Uh, that's been worked up to um, uh, being able to support Aboriginal businesses, um, but not in the sense of just running the procurement and then waiting for an Aboriginal business to come through the door, but to uh, you know running workshops to develop the you know, the skills and the capabilities of, of Aboriginal businesses, making sure that uh, not only are they included and given the opportunity to bid, but people are actually working with them. Um, but in terms of you know, the broader social licence, there and getting back to, you know, large um, private companies, um, there is a much greater uh, understanding that, you know, large companies in um, in South Australia, particularly companies in the in the natural resource business, large mining companies, uh, they are they are um, taking advantage or exploiting um, assets and which are publicly owned. There is a much greater sense that um, they have to go about their business with a very conscious view about the their social license and its enlightened self interest. But they have been very happy to participate in programs that the government runs, which supports Aboriginal businesses because it facilitates what they're trying to do, not out of, it's in inspired altruism, <laughs> but that's the best kind, I mean, and, but the government has a role there, not actually, you know, enforcing, uh, you know, Aboriginal contracts with, you know, mining companies, but setting up an environment where it, they're actually encouraged and also that they're provided with the opportunity to make it work, so. Okay, well look, um, on behalf of everybody here, um, I'd like to thank Carol and Rob, Don, and you especially, Alison. The um, speech was great. The panel discussion has been terrific. And um, could everybody please give the uh, crew here a round of applause before they return to their seats. Thank you. For the uh, vote of thanks, I'd now like to welcome to the stage the former Premier of South Australia, Chair of the Don Dunstan Foundation, the Honourable Reverend Lynn Arnold. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> thanks very much, uh, Tony Jones. I mean, David Pemberthy. Um, it's, uh, I feel privileged to be invited tonight to give this vote of thanks to what has been a very interesting discussion sparked by a, uh, a very thoughtful presentation by you, Alison. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the, uh, the whole uh, thinker in residency uh, plays out. Um, I, uh, there's so much I could say, and it's not my job to do that, but I will say a few things, because I've got the mic. Um, the, uh, uh, I, first of all, you, know, you, you looked at things at a macro level, at a meso level, and a micro level, and so I want to make a quick comment on each of those. At the macro level, uh, I was really taken with what you were saying uh, about the, the whole proposition, the whole possibility, the whole opportunity that is represented by uh, social capital in, uh, in our society. If I were to have one criticism, uh, it would be your graphic. The graphic about uh, the growth areas of employment and uh, the, uh, the decline areas of employment. It struck me that that graphic conveys the message that all of this is a plan B. All of this is an excuse 
uh, for what we should do to meet that problem. But in fact, it's a much bigger thing, and you've said that yourself in the very way you've presented all the opportunities that are happening with uh, social enterprises uh, around the world. These are not simply plan Bs. These are a better way in which to do things. I was struck uh, um, at an article in this the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs by Jeff Coughlin and Robert Kahane. Uh, the liberal order is rigged. Fix it now or watch it wither. And one of the things they say is that Brexit and Trump phenomena reflect a breakdown of the social contract at the core of liberal democracy. Those who, and that uh, social contract is, those who do well in the market-based society promise to make sure that those disadvantaged by market forces do not fall too far behind. And the whole essence, to my mind, of what you were saying and what I would certainly support in social uh, um, enterprise, in social capital, is that this becomes an exercise in community, that we are in this together. And you've highlighted uh, the, the great opportunities for the stakeholders in South Australia because we have so much going for us. And various of our panellists, on you and others, uh, Rob uh, and, and, and uh, Carolyn, uh, looked at how those things work, can work so well here. Um, you know, what strikes me is uh, uh, that we do have issues of um, co-creating, of co-governance, of co-design. This is not a dependency relationship where community is dependent upon someone else. They are part of the action, co-munity. Uh, and, uh, and that's one of the great strengths of what uh, this is all, uh, all, all offering. And of course, as somebody who lived and worked in the northern area for nearly a quarter of a century, and all my kids were born there, and most of my in-laws still live in the area which I was proud to be associated with for all those years, uh, one of the things that always stands out to me from such communities is resilience. And that is a huge community asset that is so often overlooked by all the other ways we do business. But that resilience is there to help create uh, uh, for, for everyone's sake. Finally, at the, mac at the micro level, at, the, at, the, at the, what you might call the administrative level, but still critically important, you raise the issues of how some of these things need to be uh, approached. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, having been involved in uh, a CEO of, of not-for-profits, World Vision, first then uh, Anglicare, I know that how often the, the capacity of those organizations to actually engage in the wider context had its own limitations, albeit successful as those organizations were. For example, raising of capital, and you need capital for investment and for innovation. It's just not in the design structure of not-for-profits to do that. And so you've, 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 you focused on, on that when you were talking about the, the ways in which asset uh, uh, um, secure investment, capital, asset-based approach. Um, and so there was a great deal coming uh, uh, from that as well. And there's so much more, and I must stop my further comments because I've got a whole page of them. Um, <laughs> Suffice to say, I'm really excited at this uh, thinker in residency. I think this is going to offer us great opportunity. But you yourself said that if this is to be the case, we need to be all in this together. Change makers are all of us. Uh, I think, David, you might have said that, actually. The, uh, that's why you didn't call it change makers in residence. You call it because we are the change makers, and we take the fuel, the catalyst that, that you have brought to it. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and may I say our panelists today, uh, uh, the uh, Don Russell, Rob DeMonte, and Carolyn Curtis, uh, you were great in being able to feed off those ideas and bring in other ideas, respond to questions and comments from the audience. And so, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking uh, Alison Hewitt, um, uh, Rob DeMonte, Carolyn Curtis, Don Russell, and of course our MC, Tony Jones, David Pemberthy. We're going to be having some refreshments outside in a minute. They'll be sooner when I finish. Um, and so I have some other people to thank as well. Um, first of all, uh, the presenting partners, Meals on Wheels, Helping Hand, and RAA. It functions like this, and of course our university partners, the University of Adelaide and Flinders University. Uh, events like this take a lot of support from presenting partners. And so we certainly want to acknowledge uh, their, their help. And in addition to that, event sponsors whose, uh, whose products you'll be enjoying, Bickford's and Parade Cellars. Uh, uh, and uh, again, they, they become critically important for us. Uh, and may I say for, for this function, and generally speaking for this uh, social capital residencies and the general thinker and residence program, 
all our partners in the process, and I mentioned the universities, Adelaide and Flinders. I'd also want to mention the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Taxi, of course, uh, and it's, it's so great to see that headquartered here in, in South Australia, and Social Capital. Um, and none of that would have been possible if it weren't for David's team at the Don Dunson Foundation, uh, Trish Thea, Colleen, and the uh, interns and, and, and the volunteers who come in to, to help us in the foundation. Um, so uh, uh, I want to thank all of them uh, as well. And please, please, would you join me in thanking all of those? So. Um, now, as an example of social enterprise at work, um, in thanking Alison and the panel members, uh, I want to say that the Foundation has given each of them a donation to allocate to the organisation of their choice via the Good Thanks platform. And if you were present at the relaunch of Thinkers in Residency, you'll know that this is a very exciting social enterprise innovation coming out of South Australia uh, that has partnered in the social capital residencies. Its principle is simple. When someone does good, you say thanks by making a donation. Um, I would like to thank all of you for being here this evening for this event and ask you to be a change maker following uh, as this uh, whole process uh, goes on further. You'll be receiving invitations for the next residency events, including events with Susie Sosa and uh, David uh, mentioned uh, uh, Susie, the next expert thinker uh, who uh, will visit South Australia from the 3rd to the 11th of July. Is that that's right, David? Um, and finally, can I also encourage you to other Don Dunstan Foundation events. Uh, we have uh, Reconciliation Week events, so Reconciliation Week between 27th of May and 3rd of June, so it's coming up, check your diaries. Uh, the Loitcher O'Donoghue Oration being a uh, key event in that week on the 30th of May, and Father Frank Brennan is, the, is this year's orator. We also have two film nights, the screening of Marbo and Vote Yes for Aborigines. Um, and then on the uh, 22nd of May, the Adelaide Festival of Ideas, the Don Dunson Foundation and Green Industries South Australia will present an event called Transforming Work, How Cooperatively Owned Digital Platforms Create Jobs, with Trevor Schultz, a founder of the platform Cooperative Cooperativism Movement, excuse me, and one of the network's cultures, uh, one of network's culture's toughest critics of the sharing economy. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being part of this. This is a, uh, an exciting process which I think uh, South Australia has so much uh, to offer by virtue of our history, our present and our willingness to take on the future. Would you now please join uh, me and all of you uh, in sticking around for a drink and uh, refreshments outside in the foyer. Thank you very much.